Hello there, it's Tom and Magnolia here for chapter 69 of Gunner Creek Court, Loop's Trick. Hello there. Oh, and for the rest of the video, we're probably going to switch back and forth between calling him Loop or Loop, so please excuse us for that. So this is the beginning of book eight, and it comes right after the death of Coyote and the creation of this Lou creature. And Annie has found out that she has been stuck in the forest for six months and is now heading back into the court after Lou has essentially erased the ravine and the Annan waters. And the first thing she has to do is cross this barrier, and she's relieved to see that she's still able to cross it. Are these characters based on anything, or were you just drawing random characters? No, the characters themselves are random, but the outfits are based on just basic UK police uniforms you know like basic stab vest and white shirt and black tie and, and stuff like that so no they weren't based on anybody specific but they do stop Annie while she's wandering through the destruction at the front of the court and they don't seem to even really know who she is was this something that you had a hard time setting up without giving too much away uh no not really uh, there's a bit of a twist coming in just a few pages time I guess I try a bit of misdirection to not hint too much but not have it come out of nowhere but we'll see in a second that these patrol people put Annie in this basically interrogation or waiting room and when her father and cat come along uh, Annie also comes along with them and that's the surprise at the beginning of this book is the fact that there will be two Annies. Was this two Annies thing something you'd planned for a long time? Yeah it was this has been a long time coming for me and um, I was thankful to actually finally get to it and it's something that wasn't going to just be like um, a temporary thing that happened for a little while and then disappeared you know and everybody forgot about like uh, in typical episodic TV kind of style it was something that is going to be prolonged and basically the majority of this book deals with the relationship between the two of them. Do you want to talk a little bit about what is so compelling to you about this concept or do you want to save that for like later chapters maybe? Well, I suppose that might be better to talk about in the next video where it does deal with the two of them talking it out with each other and that's kind of what I wanted to get to with these two. So the first part of this situation is, you know, figuring out if this Annie who's come from the forest is real or not and kind of everybody sort of being against her and, and not really thinking that she's real, you know, that she's some sort of imposter and, and a lot of this chapter deals with that as well as catching Annie and us the reader up with a new situation situation in the court because we see that literally six months has passed and for me that was a good way of having a little bit of a time skip and having things progress for a while but then having a natural way of having that conveyed to the reader instead of just having somebody just narrate everything that's changed it's interesting and it's also sad to see cat not really like welcoming annie back the way she had hoped for because she feels like annie's been there the whole time it's it's a nice situation i mean it's a sad situation but it's interesting yeah i know what you mean yeah so from the court annie's point of view all that happened was that she went into the forest and saw a creature that kind of seemed like a sangren, but he just kicked her straight back out again. And even even from her point of view, she was there overnight, even though for her it would only have been a few minutes. But they really have no idea of the stuff that Annie that did get to talk to Lou really was able to discuss with him. Did you get the sense that readers bought that both Annies were real at first, or did it take them a while to not suspect one as an imposter or not? Uh, no, the readers were pretty... Uh, happy and excited about it and it did seem like a lot of them felt that the Annie with the short hair was the imposter perhaps and I guess that probably would have been like narratively the more obvious thing to do you know to have the one who's been here the whole time as if they were some sort of imposter that has been gathering information and stuff and I, I, but I wanted to avoid that and basically explicitly say that no that they're not it's not an imposter situation it's a situation where the two of them are as real as, as the other you know the only difference between them is the time spent in one area of the court and one area of the forest well, it's nice that you have so many characters who can be seen as an authority who can kind of confirm, no, she's real, like Jones and Renard and everyone. Exactly, yeah. And that's kind of what I spend in this chapter doing. And really, the only the only two who are suspicious of the other are the Annies themselves. And that's what the rest of the book and the, the next few chapters are about. But so after they have a little confrontation, they start off on a tour, basically, of catching Annie and the readers up on what's changed since she's been gone. And we see... Some of the robots seem to have been reactivated, their cat's not very happy about it. We see that Annie's father has the hand that they were working on previously is, is now working, and, and here we've not had to see a lot of the steps of them developing that technology. We just see the final result here, and it's almost a, an entirely perfect working hand. I love the little sequence at the end of the page, too. This whole thing with the two Annies and their dad, at least at the beginning, when, they, when they're sort of at odds, it kind of reminds me of the feeling of when... 
when a parent is like nicer to your friend over them than you feel they are to you and you get jealous you know what i mean it's it's very visceral to me yeah and that's kind of what i was trying to set up here as well like as well as a, again a little bit of misdirection people may be thinking that the short-haired annie is some sort of imposter because she's getting on with her dad but no the, the reality is that she's just spent you know six months longer working with him and helping with his rehabilitation with the replacement of his hand and that kind of thing and so you know because annie has vied so much for the attention of her father in the story so far it's pretty natural to have the two of them sort of playing off each other that way um, and we see part of normal life in the court now is that creatures have entered into the court through this underground tree system that Lou mentioned um, towards the end of the previous chapter so this gave me an opportunity to introduce the bound dogs again you know that we know are controlled by these shadow men but we see that from the point of view of Annie and Cat and Tony, at least the short-haired Annie, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, you know, and they pretty quickly dispatch him. And Cat seems to have some sort of technology that allows her to get the train running again. And those are just kind of indications of stuff that we'll talk about later on in the in the chapters. But we can see from long-haired Annie's point of view that things kind of have moved on and changed. But they head off to collect Jones, who's, I guess, also been away for the past six months, and she's been sent back down to Earth by Lou. And this is, you know, another place where we can get indication that the two Annies are as real as each other. Because, as you said earlier, Jones is kind of an authority here, and really having a duplicate of, of a person is not something that is particularly surprising to her uh, or anything that she's never seen before. And I kind of, I did want to treat this whole situation as, as if it wasn't something amazing special it's kind of shocking at first but you know considering where they live and the stuff that they've seen in the past it's not really outside of the realm of possibility and they do set up a little bit more of what the rest of the book will be covering which is finding the artifacts for Lou and possibly bringing them back to him we see most of this chapter from long-haired Annie's point of view so I think it's easy to overlook the fact that as we see here short-haired Annie is just learning that Isengrin is really dead and maybe for the past six months she's felt that he's alive because she saw some Something like him in the forest so it is must be like a big shock to her yeah that's right and this is another indication that long-haired Annie because she's kind of overhearing this conversation this is giving her a little inkling that you know the other Annie is feeling the same way that she herself is um the Annie who's come from the forest is sort of used to the idea that Sengren is no more but it really is you know very sad for her and so it, that news itself would be sad for the Annie that has spent the last six months in the court and also I guess uh, about the perspective thing I, I kind of intentionally kept the perspective mainly from the long-haired Annie uh, the way I thought of it was because she was the one that the reader and the quote-unquote camera is is with as she goes into the forest I wanted to keep the perspective from her even though she's come back and there is another Annie you know mm -hmm. so I didn't want to be constantly switching between the perspectives of the two, you know, the long-haired and the short-haired Annie, I wanted to kind of focus it around the long-haired. And that did sort of go towards a little bit, throwing the readers off as to, you know, what maybe one is an imposter and one isn't an imposter. But it was also just so I could focus things from just one perspective, you know, rather than trying to bounce back and forth, you know, in, a, in an already kind of strangely complicated situation. But in the meantime, they head off to where everyone is living now because we've learned in the EVAC chapter that everyone in the court has pretty much pushed back to the coast and so everyone is now living in these sort of coastal village looking areas you know and I, I took a lot of reference from coastal villages in the UK just to see what they look like and I wanted to evoke that sort of feeling but also the overgrown kind of bland purpley grey colour of the court and I guess also this is this book's equivalent of the kids having a new dorm at the you know the beginning of a new year oh I never thought of it that way hmm. so they basically progressed from having a bunk to having um, a small room in a tower then having their own individual rooms in a tower block and then now that every they all basically have a house you know so they're basically getting bigger and bigger and more autonomous kind of lives that they're living although what point is this in the school year like it isn't actually a new school year yet is it well the time in the passing of the school year now is kind of intentionally vague um summer probably did pass in the six months that annie was away so it could it well be a new school year but really you know lessons are disrupted and the school structure as itself is kind of up in the air so there's only really small indications as to how that's going on but anyway they're figuring out where they want to live and tony invites the long-haired annie to come and live with them because we see that short-haired annie is currently living with her dad and also living with them there is a sangren another authority no not a sangren <laughs> <laughs> that would be very different. Yeah, he's just there. And also living with them there is Renard, who is also another authority on the possibility of the two Annies just being basically the true Annie. And a small test they've done is that they're both able to command him to do something. 
It's always fun to see Renard doing things like a dog, like rolling over and stuff. Yeah. It's interesting also that it seems like the animosity between Renard and Tony has faded somewhat. And I kind of like how you do that with Renard, where it's kind of the same with Eglamore, where they've kind of become friends over the course of the comic, although we didn't get to see it. It's just something that's happened quietly in the background. Yeah, time has passed, and they're not particularly petty people that, that hold grudges in the same way that those ca- other characters do. So they've come to a situation where they're just kind of comfortable and their relationship has moved on. And it's not really super important to the, the comic. It's more the development of the relationship between Annie and and the other characters rather than the background characters. So I think it's natural for people to go in and out of relationships like that, but not particularly spend too much time illustrating that. Well, it's also nice to see Renard because if he's able to be that with Tony, it means he's moved on from obsessing about Surma, which is probably healthier for him. Yeah, well, it has been a few years now, so... (laughs) <laughs> He's uh, pretty much comfortable with his lot in life right now. And so the last section of this chapter is just showing that the two Annies really aren't getting along, you know. And it's kind of like having somebody intrude into your life and take possession of everything that you own, you know. Because uh, the short-haired Annie has been living here fine and getting on with her life. But now this other person that looks and sounds and acts exactly like her has come in. And she's saying that they have to share clothes and they have to share a father and share Renard and whatever. And um, the short-haired Annie, you know, because she is kind of a bit of a brat. She's kind of stubborn, as we've seen in the comic up to now. She's just not really happy about it. But the little surprise at the end of this chapter is that Tony is taking everything with good humor, and once the other two leave, he seems to have switched back to his more lighthearted, easygoing personality, which is something that Annie has really not seen before. And that's something that they will talk about later on. But in the meantime, Annie's just going to enjoy it and just have a night of cooking with her dad, which is something she's never done before. It's just nice because she's been through so much and it seems like she's kind of lost everything with this event so it's nice to let her have this this moment and she does seem really happy with it so yeah well ever since she stepped back into the forest pretty much everybody and everything has been against her and so this chapter ends with this one thing that is not against her and she's perfectly happy you know so (laughs) it was just a nice way to end the chapter and the bonus page is just a bit of you know, information about what these red and yellow and green zones were. They're, they're probably pretty self-explanatory, which is why I didn't spend any time going over that information in the comic. It was just something I could leave in the bonus page. Are the two big red spots uh, where the trees are? Yeah, those would be the main epicenters of when the trees burst up from the ground. And and Eglamore did mention that the red spots and the yellow areas have been growing recently, and so you can see that a few are popping up. And that's it for this chapter. So come back again for chapter 70, Dealing With Her. Bye!